Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, we have uh, you as one of the famous person here, and uh, it is quite good to to be here, indeed. But first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to very heartily thank all of you for being here. As we are not here for the speeches, but to deliver a message, a very powerful message, I dare say, that says to all those who are actually culprits in this area, that we are behind you and we really will follow you until you no longer there exist. I would also like to thank the organizers of uh, this march, not only this one, by the way, those who have organized across the world. In South Africa, we have marches in Bloemfontein, in Cape Town. Some of my colleagues are there working with uh, yourselves as very concerned people. We do like to have concerned people like yourselves because indeed, it is for this reason that we're saying, Alice, Alice, not on our watch, not on my watch. Uh, we're saying not on our watch. Not on my watch. Because if I'm alone, I'm sure the syndicates would, can easily run yeah, behind and in front and so on. So we all have to be here, and I, that's what I see here today, that we are here to do that and to say that. We have acknowledged your document, uh, the demands, and I would like to assure you that we will look at these uh, demands uh, very carefully. We will not look at them away from you. We will obviously have to get together, as uh, the previous speaker indicated, that there is that, that distance. And I want to ask that as the uh, collective that's here, perhaps it's necessary that we record our existing organizations also with the Department of Environmental Affairs. The reason why I'm saying so is because I do know and I'm aware that my colleagues at uh, various levels, and including myself, me, do meet with some of the organizations, but they are ongoing meetings, constant, periodic, that are with stakeholders. And therefore, it's necessary that as we meet with representatives of stakeholders, some of the organizations are not left behind. That's quite important because there is probably that case existing now. It's not that we are not uh, meeting. I'm making this plea because we don't want to have anybody remaining behind. We have to act together. We have to be together in all our thinking because some of the ideas that may come out of you, none of us may be remembering or thinking about as we meet with the current stakeholder forum that we are utilizing or working with. I just want to uh, very briefly share with you some of the uh, measures that we are taking right now and of course I do know that this may not be quite conclusive as I may have omitted some of the uh, very minor or that may be important but small detail that may be important in the measures that we are undertaking right now and the measures that we are undertaking is on behalf of South Africa and on behalf of the whole world we are not purporting, purporting to be cleverer than all of you but we think that these measures are very, very important and they need to be taken. Firstly, on the elephant. For the past three days here in South Africa, we had a meeting of all elephant ranch states meeting at the Kruger National Park. And the meeting was convened by South Africa. Even though we do not have a lot of poaching happening. Three is too much, by the way. We lost three elephants this year. It's too much. But those who are like Zimbabwe, who are losing 50 at a time, 
uh, from poisoning that happened recently, Mozambique and so on, they have much higher numbers. They were here in South Africa at the Kruger National Park. What happened there was to put together what we call the elephant plan, management plan. And this management plan takes into cognizance and very much ahead of every other thing that we are doing as a continent in this arena. The issues of securing and security and also dealing with these poachers who kill our elephants for their ivory. So the plan was also being re-looked into, reviewed, and it is a plan that is not being looked at for the first time. It was uh, put in place a few years ago. And yesterday, the South Africa declared one million rand uh, made available to support that African plan to deal with the management of rhino, including fighting this poaching on the continent. We previously, we previously as South Africans and as South Africa contributed to this elephant fund that was agreed to be set up. It's not a very big amount, but it is something, 250,000 that was donated and contributed by South Africa to this nations where poaching of elephant is very high. So we are part of the plan. We are working with the continent and we'll continue to work with the continent. Currently, we're chairing that elephant fund uh, for, for, uh, at the continental level. We do say it is important that we work much harder. So any one of us who's here today with more ideas, any idea is better than nothing. We are prepared to listen. We will evaluate with you all the ideas that we are putting on the table and obviously act upon them with yourselves, as well as with the entire continent of Africa. The second area that I want to get into is this issue, the vexing issue of rhino. I do note that in the memorandum you're saying we are concerned. And I think it is important that maybe we convert this concern to something that says we actually spend sleepless nights. Because uh, maybe to be concerned could sound like a bit of an understatement. We are spending sleepless nights with regards to the level of poaching of rhino in South Africa. We come from very humble beginnings. We're here in South Africa in the 50s. We had uh, just, under, just under 50 rhinos at Ushutuwe Umfolozi. And because of our management practices that are so good, we were able to uh, increase our population to the numbers that our children and our young ones were talking to, 21,000. Now we have about 18,000 from under 50. No country in the world has got these numbers. We are followed by Namibia with just around 3,000. So I'm saying, we are the only reason why a rhino exists in the world. And we say so with pride. If it wasn't because of South Africa, there wouldn't have been rhino in the whole world. Probably in, Mos in, 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 in um, uh, Namibia, but yes, the numbers are here. And I'm sure uh, the statistics are there out there for you to look at. But as we say this, this is the reason why we must say, not on our watch. We're not going to look at anybody, no matter who you are, how wealthy you are, to actually decimate our rhino populations. We're not going to do that. And therefore, I want to share with you some of the measures that you may probably not have been aware of. Because I do notice that in the memorandum, you also referring to some of those issues. There are several categories that I'm going to talk to. I start first with the legal front. We deemed it fit that from a hunting perspective, which is currently a legal operation in South Africa, we look at the laws that regulate that field. And indeed, we found several loopholes. And we close those loopholes. 
There may be some remaining. I'm talking about the legal uh, operation and front. We close those loopholes. There may be some remaining. Let us share with you as we meet those areas where which you have identified as some of the areas that may require a close in the loopholes. One of the loopholes that you may be aware of that's quite popularly known is to disallow and to eradicate completely this thing called pseudo hunting. Because people within our own national permitting system, people used to just sit somewhere in box back, uh, in your nice bikinis, in front of a swimming pool, somebody applies for a hunting permit for you. And it comes out in your name and a permit is given. You there, you don't even know how a rifle looks like in your whole entire life. And a permit is given under your name. Somebody takes this permit, enters our bushes, and go and kill our animals. In your name, you come back and post next to our lovely icon, dead, and now saying, I have, I'm the one who actually caught, uh, uh, hunted this. We found those loopholes, we closed them. We now require every hunt to be followed by a qualified uh, 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 um, ranger. We actually have said to those who were, whose these permits were coming from, and I must say in this instance, more, majority of those permits were coming from Vietnam as a country, and I'm not isolating Vietnam because there are several countries on the East Asian market countries that we are working with, East Asian uh, area which we are working with. We said to Vietnam, we want to have your register of your outfitters. If we don't have it, none of your people is going to be permitted to come into South Africa to do any hunting. <laughs> Guess what happened? The permits that we had, over 400 permits, uh, or it was over 300 permits applications at some stage in one year, reduced to three. One, two, three. We received only those three applications, which meant that something was not right. Something was happening, probably that's where the pseudo hunters were applying to. Now that loophole has been closed. Vietnam and all other countries are supposed, all expected to give us the record of their outfitters who are qualified. If they are not on that list, none of them comes to South Africa. That's other area that we closed. We also said that we need to ensure that all our operators or our game, rent, uh, game farmers, who some of whom are actually uh, in this business, we know that it's not everybody who's a son of God properly. Uh, those who are a little bit crooked, uh, who are born, they exist uh, here, that we need to work hard on ensuring that even that area is dealt with and is addressed by monitoring, evaluation, and so on and so on. So at least those are, there may be others that have left. I now want to come to security area. We have, after a long time of pleading and working, got Sandaf, South African National Defense Force, back on the borders of Mozambique. After a long time of pleading. They are now there on the borders of Mozambique. But the biggest problem that we have is that on the other side of the border of Mozambique, the security is not as tight as it should be. And this is one area that we are working with on, in Mozambique to get them to increase security on their side. So there is not only policing on the South African side that happens or security on the South African side. We have now ensured that we support Sandaf in getting more money from Treasury. Two years ago, they were in danger and had no budget budgets. We went to plead with Treasury and knocked and worked on business cases. They were given additional money. That's why they're still operating here. We have opened an op center, operation center, a fully fleshed one with all helicopters and whatever that are necessary as and when they are needed inside the Kruger National Park.
to operate and that center started operating on the 1st of September this year. It's supposed it's to do evidence if there's poaching to be done. I mean, it's, if it's, it has happened, they've got to be on the ground and take samples and all sorts of necessary uh, uh, measures to actually ensure that we catch those who have been uh, poaching. In, in the center, we'd also said by Commissioner Pierre that at any time when we call upon them, all sorts of old helicopters and all sorts of armed equipment that need to be at the Kruger or at a spot at a time, those are there. We have also uh, been uh, told and informed that the center also deals with um, issues of, um, well, let me just put it this way. There actually is a special operations committee, a special operations team that is led by one of the most famous and very important uh, security persons who were able in this country to follow some of the crimes and actually bring those criminals to book. That person is uh, General Moon, I think Moon. He's heading that team that's working at the Kruger National Park. So there's a special force operating in Kruger National Park deployed by the security cluster. We have also from our own side increased the ranger, numbers of rangers. And I'm sure some of you will wonder why am I talking about rangers when I talk about security? Because the ranger community is not to be about security. The rangers are there to deal with conservation functions. But it's such a pity that here now, as we are facing this big battle, we are now compromising and getting our rangers now to be on the battle lines and actually help in that front. And we have increased the numbers, we have trained them, they've been trained by the School of Rangers International. We have now deployed them, we have given them a uniform. Madam uh, is that Elise, they are working under supervision of General Yuatste, a retired army person who's there to guide them. And they have really put a plan that's very impressive in the Kruger National Park. It's just that sometimes some of these things take quite a while to, for us to realize some desired results. But they, for me, there is something that I see beginning to happen in the Kruger National Park. Since General Dwesta has actually dissected that Kruger National Park, because that's where we have the highest poachers, dissected it into segments and ensured that for every portion, there is a special kind of suitable uh, operation that happens in those. This center that is, I'm talking about is going to make the area, especially the southern part, a no-go zone for any poacher who have ambitions, because that's where they, the poachers go in their numbers. I also want to just uh, indicate that um, the intelligence services is being increased and has been increased of late. There are technologies that we are examining we are engaging the Department of Transport because what I saw here, it was an unmanned vehicle, a little one. We want to introduce those, but the Department of Transport said this to us. We need to contain, uh, to maintain certain heights for the unmanned vehicles because that area is where the aeroplanes go towards landing. And there might be accidents if you are not careful. So we are working with them to finalize the heights at which the unmanned vehicles may be and operating and others may not, uh, the, the aeroplanes operating. And of course, these are very important technology issues for us to be able to see and to look over what is happening there. And of course, there are concerns, I may say, have to say this as well, that some of the technologies that are not really quite properly vetted may bring about other unintended consequences of looking into your areas. I was in London just recently coming from the, uh, uh, UNGA, United Nations General Assembly. And I read a paper wherein uh, people in London, the uh, nationalists there are saying, technology has advanced so much that people are actually looking at you inside your bedroom. I've read about it. Where the poisoning of a horn was being investigated. That experiment unfortunately didn't go too well because I think it wasn't really working that, uh, to, to an extent that people can be deterred by the poisoned horn. 
We were funded by the national lotteries, which we are very grateful for, for that experiment to be done. Unfortunately, it didn't. If it had worked, I'm telling you, we would have poisoned every horn of every rhino in this country the next day. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Now, we are also doing the DNA sampling for all for persecutions, but also for being able to detect whatever needs to be detected from security point of view. We are looking at many other technologies that are currently being vetted. We are at a, an international level working with the international community. We have signed a memorandum of understanding with Mozambique, and this is what allows us to go to Mozambique and say, bring security on your side, Mozambique. If you don't, we will actually lift our fence that used to be there between us and Mozambique, if they don't. So we are being led there, as the speaker before me said, that we are being led by the defense department. We are waiting for them to be ready to take us again there to go and engage Mozambicans. I wish some of you could have been there in the last meeting that we had with Mozambicans. It was real gloves off, if you understand what gloves off means. Because they were saying to us that you are shooting our people. We said to them, we don't see people. We see criminals in front of us. And if it is a criminal, we will shoot. That's what we said. We also are doing issues of awareness in various countries. In Mozambique, in a, wherever we have got a memorandum of understanding with those people. In Vietnam, the Vietnamese were here already three times. They are doing what you did here, working with social, social, do you call, what do you call it, social? Media. Uh, media. <laughs> with social media to bring awareness to the people in Vietnam that this thing that they say the, the rhino horn does, it doesn't really do it. Uh, whatever it is, uh, what they call it. So the people, young generation, are going through social media to educate their people. We don't know the language of Vietnam. That's why we've got to work with them, so that they work in their own country. We also have uh, a, to need to tighten securities. In our MOU, we, had, we are saying, we have detected that in some countries, their laws are very weak. And therefore, we can make our laws strong and hope that we will win when their laws are very weak. So in Mozambique, for instance, People had a slap on the wrist when they were caught with a whole neck of a rhino. And now they've tightened their laws, they have heavy sentences in there as well, amongst other things. We are also ensuring that this is people-centered. We're doing research jointly with those other countries that are willing to work with us. And of course, China is one of those. Those countries that we have identified are China, uh, Vietnam, Lao Republic, which we are signing with and beginning to work with this year. Thailand, now we learn that Czech Republic is also another problem that have started. We'll go to them, obviously, and we will leave no stone unturned to do our work. We need to work with those countries. We are also at another front working with the communities. I'm just about to finish, don't worry. With communities, we have detected that we have had some weaknesses here in South Africa indeed. Because our members of a community, ordinary poor people, are being lured to come and kill our rhinos, whether it's in a park or that's national park or el el elsewhere. They are being lured. And some of them are being paid up to, they say a rhino horn costs something like 10,000, 80,000 rand a kilogram. So we need to really deal with this issue. <laughs> we do think that our people must begin to have alternative economic activities. Their ownership of a rhino, for instance, which we did this year, when we contributed two rhinos to the community of them, are the, the uh, what are rulies. We should also identify other communities that must have ownership of the rhino and see value in a living rhino than in a dead rhino, which they take a horn away from. So those are some of the things that we are doing. So creation of strongholds in areas where there are community members, creation of new strongholds in other parks, creation of new strongholds in areas where there are no unscrupulous uh, operators in the game farm. Those are the areas where we are beginning to translocate some of the rhinos from Kruger National Park because they are also a little bit overpopulated, particularly on the southern side, which we want to make a no-go area. So as, we, as soon as those who understand management of uh, animals will, of the park, in the park, and in a wild like this, will understand that 
there is a need to be have a balance between male and female, but also to have adequate food for them. So this translocation will help us to replicate their numbers as we did in the 60s when we took 50 away from Umfulusi to we were into the Kruger National Park that doubled and replicated. So we're replicating them in other areas, not only in South Africa, but also on the uh, uh, Sadak continent. We have already begun translocation to Botswana, we are translocating to Zambia and to Tanzania and so on, so that we replicate the rhino. That's it. We are not running away, but we are taking measures that are quite interlinked so that we can actually uh, 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 do better. And then we uh, take your thing. <laughs> I'm here only today. We, 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 we have determined, detected that indeed there is a need to deal with issues of human resources. Our own humans, human beings, I'm sure you must have heard that there are people in the park who have been arrested also for poaching. Our own rangers, some of them, they are not all bad. Maybe even majority of them are quite good because they really do a lot of work, good work in that bush. They are alone in the Kruger National Park, that big space which is bigger than other countries. It's bigger than Israel, certainly, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a park. So we know that there are rotten potatoes sometimes in the back. And those rotten potatoes need to be eliminated. So we are indeed doing this uh, issue of uh, vetting. It is currently happening. We are vetting those. And we will vet until we, we come to the last person in, that, uh, in our operations. At justice level, we have actually followed the, the justice system. We have had several meetings with them to say, hello, we need to wake up. We need heavy sentences for these people. You have seen the 77 years of uh, a sentencing that was done now recently uh, by giving to somebody else. There's a 40 years of sentence, heavy sentence that was given to somebody else, a Thai national recently. I'm very worried, and I was saying, saying to the colleagues in the department that we need to work with the justice system now because we have seen the reduction from that 40 years of that person to 30 years and another reduction now last week to 20 years. It can be. It shouldn't really happen that once a person is sentenced like this, there must be, and the reason is that there is no a predetermined sentence. That then tells us that we must now have predetermined sentence, even on this uh, kinds of operation. So the list is long, the list is endless. All I'm saying to you is that we appreciate your presence. We appreciate your everyday work. We can see what you are doing on a daily basis with your rhino horns on those uh, Amaboko Boko, the Springbok uh, cars. We can see what we are doing on radio and everywhere else. It is a necessary thing to join hands and work together and fight this sketch because one thing that has to happen is that we must break the back of these criminals. They must be gone. And indeed, I'm not going to be disclosing some of the security features of what we are doing to break the neck of these criminals. But you can see already that there is a mini syndicate that has been wiped in South Africa just this work one and a half weeks ago. With money launderers, with lawyers, with people owning helicopters and what what, they are working with the international ones. They will give them those people to us in our hands, those who are operating with them on an international level. They must bring them. There's no way that we are going to leave even those who are outside this country. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you and say, yes, we have received your memorandum. Let's work together. We are going to be asking you to meetings. Please do so. Please register your various organizations that are there so that we are together in this. Bare Ian Drach Mark Mach. Unity is strength. Comments by Clay Sam on Salfer Tot that on Sunday. On Sunday. Uh, what is the enemy now in the Africans that they vote the they vote the vote all now? On the fire and the vote loop. Over to that the land of yield the money best and bye bye.